Bruce Rivers, he's the criminal lawyer. Well, who is he? Bruce Rivers, he's the criminal lawyer. And who is he? Bruce Rivers, he's the criminal lawyer. And what he do? And he's gonna react to all the self snitching. Oh. Hi, this is Bruce Rivers. Welcome to another episode of CLR, Criminal Lawyer Reacts, where I am a board-certified criminal defense lawyer, and I actually try cases. I um, uh, have a thriving practice where I am focused mainly on criminal defense, and here at our channel, we like to focus on, uh, we react to some drill music, and we react to issues of the day, and today we're talking about Henry Ruggs III. Henry Ruggs III uh, is a uh, guy who was playing for the Raiders. He is a, a, was playing for the Raiders. He was recently released because he was in Las Vegas uh, driving his new automobile and uh, crashed it uh, while drunk, and he's now charged with major crimes. Let's talk about who Mr. Ruggs is first. First of all, he's 22 years old, a wide receiver, played on – Bama uh, championship team and was a number one draft pick. You talk about having the ticket. He had the ticket. He had all the talent in the world and nothing but promise and and opportunity ahead of him. Well, he was recently arrested for a uh, driving incident that happened in Las Vegas. He was traveling at 156 miles per hour in a sports car with his girlfriend. And he's, his car veered out of control. Uh, he's driving in a residential neighborhood and uh, hit a 23-year-old woman and her dog and trapping them in the car. The car actually caught on fire and she lost her life. His passenger next to, her, uh, next to him, his girlfriend, she was injured as well. The police also found a loaded firearm uh, on the floorboard of the vehicle. Um, let's get into a little bit about what we're talking about here. Criminal vehicular operation is when you operate a vehicle uh, and you cause substantial bodily harm. Criminal vehicular homicide is where you are operating a vehicle under the influence of alcohol um, and you're exceeding the legal limit, which is 0.08, and uh, you cause the death. And that's what happened here. So by the ordinary process of law, he was arrested. Um, they took blood from him, and now he just appeared in court. Let's kind of, uh, I'm going to show you, first of all, if you take a look here, this is what his vehicle looked like. Very, very serious car accident. Now, let's talk about what the next process is once you get arrested. Once you get arrested, they have to bring you to see a judge within a certain period of time generally within uh, 36 to 48 hours, depending upon your jurisdiction. Once you get in front of the judge, the judge determines two things. Hey, this is like your initial appearance. Number one, they read you the charges, or you can waive reading of the charges. Then they determine the conditions of release. And in a homicide, there are other factors involved in the, in the conditions of release, mostly the danger to the public. Uh, there's, but there's two things. There's one, whether you're going to return to court, you know, risk of flight. And then the other one is uh, whether you're a danger to the public. And so let's let's kind of watch the opening argument or the argument that the prosecutor um, has for what he thinks the um, bail should be in this case. And I'll next hear uh, from Mr. Bauman the state's position on uh, Mr. Rick's custody status. Thank you, Your Honor. For the record, Eric Bauman for the state court number 9755. Your Honor, as you mentioned, the incident, uh, the crime and its tragic consequences took place yesterday, approximately 3.39 a.m. Northbound Rainbow Boulevard, just south of Spring Valley, which I know for the record is a residential area. The defendant was traveling at a, at beyond an excessive rate of speed. Eyewitnesses put the defendant at over 100 miles an hour. Now, when you're traveling over at 100 miles an hour um, in a residential neighborhood, that's not good. Um, and here's the other thing. The time of day that this happened was 3.39 in the morning. 3.39. Can I tell you something, guys? Guys, listen to me. Nothing good happens after midnight. All right? Don't be the FOMO where you're going to, like, worry about, you know, what's going to happen if I don't go to this party. You know what? 
if you went to bed at 11.30 and your buddy went to the party and got pissed drunk and, and gets popped on the way home, guess who's better for it? The guy who didn't go to the party. So let's tune back in. We were able to confirm through investigation through a download of the airbag control module from his vehicle that at 2.5 seconds prior to impact, he was traveling at 156 miles per hour northbound on Rainbow Boulevard. I would note that in my 24 plus years of prosecuting vehicular crimes, that is the highest speed I have ever heard of in an incident like this. So this is kind of arguing the case. You know, it's their prerogative to do that. Um, and you're going to hear that uh, in a little bit uh, from uh, the excellent uh, David Chesnoff, who is a, uh, part of the board of uh, American Board of Criminal Lawyers, fantastic lawyer. At the point of airbag deployment, the vehicle was traveling at 127 miles per hour. Uh, no further than to investigation, there was a loaded firearm found in the driver's floorboard of the vehicle. And the loaded firearm charge, you know, it's not illegal for him to have the firearm, but it's illegal for him to be intoxicated and be in possession of the firearm while, while in a motor vehicle. But that's the least of his problems. Defendant's vehicle struck the rear of the victim vehicle with such violent force that it ignited the fuel tank. 23-year-old female occupant and her dog died as a result of the fire caused by the crash. Furthermore, we anticipate filing a second count of DUI causing substantial bodily harm as a result of the injuries to defendant's passenger. So you've got two victims in a case like this. One, the decedent, that's the person who died in the other car, and then you've got his passenger. And when you have more than one victim, what the court can do is they can uh, sentence those things consecutively, and, uh, and sometimes it's mandatory consecutive. I don't think it is in this case, especially because it's the first time. Defendant was argumentative and uncooperative with both police and medical workers throughout the investigative process. That is never a good sign when you're argumentative and uncooperative. You don't call the cops names. You don't um, try to fight with the cops. Even if it's an illegal arrest, you don't have the right to resist. And, um, and it just never helps you. Um, better just to shut your mouth and, and then your lawyer can shove it up their ass later. Whoever a search warrant was obtained, blood was drawn from the defendant within two hours of the time of driving. Did blood alcohol level? So when you're stopped for a DWI, you have, if they have a breath test, it's generally a crime to refuse. However, in this case, they got a warrant uh, because it's a search and seizure to take your blood so in order to get your blood they have to have a warrant and so they get a warrant now you can't refuse and they'll forcibly take your blood from you level was measured by the metropolitan police department forensic laboratory to be 0.161 so 0.161 is pretty intoxicated it's it's double the legal limit within two hours of the time of driving there's more than twice the legal limit. Furthermore, I would note that at that blood alcohol level, he was also, under the laws of the state of Nevada, illegally in possession of a firearm. I would note this is particularly tragic. Since 2013, the National Football League Players Association has contracted with various rideshare services, specifically to provide free rideshares availability to their membership, specifically to prevent tragedies such as this. Now, here's the thing. He's right. He's absolutely right. But he, he's inflaming this uh, to make it uh, sensational. And, and, it, and I don't want to take anything away from what happened because it is, it is a tragedy. There's a loss of life here. It's not an intentional loss of life, but that's not what he's charged with. But when he, he's going on and on and on and, um, and to try to keep him in custody. Now, in consideration of bail... I would note for the court that the defendant is facing significant mandatory prison time. Under the charges we anticipate filing, there's a maximum of 46 years in the Nevada State Prison to which he's exposed. First of all, it's a first-time offense. There's no way he's getting 46 years. It just isn't going to happen. But there is a mandatory two-year um, prison sentence. 
and that is something that the prosecutor cannot negotiate away. Uh, in fact, it's written in the statute that that the penalty, the two-year mandatory minimum, cannot be negotiated. I mean, they can negotiate it up from there, but they can't n negotiate anything less than two years. Upon the evidence gathered and analysis done so, thus far, I can represent as an officer of the court that the likelihood of conviction is high. Based on defendant's reckless, wild, and out of control course of conduct that resulted, already has resulted in the loss of human life, the defendant has established that he's a danger to our community. Any release should be conditioned on high level electronic monitoring, surrender of defendant's passport if he has one, a strict no driving order, and 24 7 alcohol monitoring. Finally, I would submit that the court should consider the defendant likely has significant financial means at his disposal to post bail. For these reasons, the state is requesting bail be set the amount of $1 million with the previously mentioned release condition. Now, $1 million is an awful lot of money on a case like this. Generally speaking, you don't have that high a bail on a criminal vehicular operation or a criminal vehicular homicide case. So that was the prosecution trying to just showcase um, basically what the case is about. And I think they did a pretty good job. They sensationalized it a bit, but a million dollars is too high. And we you see here, here, Mr. Chesnoff, this is how you deliver a bail argument. As the court knows, the purpose of this appearance at this point in time is to determine the conditions of release, not to argue the merits of the case, although the facts of the case are one factor for the court to consider. The court knows that bail is not punishment. If there is ever going to be punishment, that's for another day. What we have, Your Honor, is a young man who has never been in trouble before, from what we understand, never a traffic violation. The defendant's history is a big factor in determining what kind of release conditions to set. Because if if he's got a, a record a mile long, why would, we, why would we take a chance on him? He has consistently followed rules and regulations. He played for a major Division I national championship football team, followed all the rules, and was an excellent teammate. You don't become the number one draft pick and playing on a championship and then now NFL team um, by skirting rules, generally speaking. Um, this is a total product of immaturity. Player. The same applies to this scrupulous investigation that the NFL does when deciding who's going to be in the league when the team's draft. His background is impeccable. When he came to Las Vegas, Your Honor, he immediately contributed to the community. He's been working with Three Square. He works with charities at home in Montgomery, Alabama. Comes from a very close-knit family. Has five brothers. Never been in trouble. We have no quarrel with the conditions that the state is recommending. See, what the state did, um, and I think they knew what they were doing, but they set up I mean, basically, we think these would be conditions that he should be released on, and we think these are reasonable conditions. And and the best thing you can do in that case, because the judge is probably going to order that those conditions anyway, the best thing that you can do is just agree with them and say, yeah, those are reasonable. We don't have any quarrel with those. Same and except for what we believe would be an excessive bail amount. The state just commented that he has financial resources, the court may not be aware, Mr. Gallman may not be aware, but he was released by the team. So the substantial financial worth that Mr. Gallman is referring to is now in question. The real question for you, Your Honor, is will he come to court and will he pose a danger? The conditions that have been proposed by the state significantly and sufficiently cover that. The question of the monetary is equally covered by the surrender of the passport and the home confinement. We asked in our papers, which Mr. Bellman has received, for a bail of $150,000. We would point out to the court that most recently... So 150000 is pretty reasonable. You only need to come up with 15000 usually 10%, and you put up a bond. You don't get that money back, or you can put up 150000 to the court, and then you get that back at the end of, of the uh, court proceeding. 
but now listen to this 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 is i think brilliant the way he he um did an analogy of somebody else that was in a similar situation but not a professional athlete a policeman who lived out of state in connecticut you hear that was a policeman that lived out of state it was granted a bail in a similar circumstance for a hundred thousand dollars we think perhaps because of the publicity that's attendant to this the district attorney is trying to send a message that's the prerogative but your honor's job is to decide what is a fair amount to guarantee his appearance and to guarantee that he is not a danger. It is not to inflame, which is what is occurring. So that's a situation where, I mean, he, that's almost, no, that is 10 times what the other, um, the, the police officer who lived out of state in a very similar situation, uh, 10 times that guy's bail. That's not, and one of the things the court is supposed to do is try to avoid disparities in treatment of individuals. So you've got a cop who, out of state who was given 100000 and now the prosecutor wants a hundred or a million dollars. That's a big disparity. What we need to do, Your Honor, is have a reasonable bail, as we've suggested, of $150,000, which is very high in these cases. Your court knows we've been involved in other situations where the bail has either been similar to that or slightly higher. It is, in my 40 years of experience, this request for a million dollars is very excessive. Now, so what Mr. Chesnoff did there was he came and he kind of looked at what the history of the cases were, and then he offered basically just a little bit more because it's a little more of an aggravated offense, basically. And and by doing that, he, he comes off credible. Now, if he would have said, Judge, I think $10,000 would be more than enough, blah, 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 he doesn't sound credible. You have to have an argument that makes sense. This is really a sad case. It's an absolutely sad case. Uh, Henry Ruggs uh, III um, is going to be, his football career is done, is absolutely done, or at least it is for now. Um, he's going to do at least two years, and then he'll probably be on probation, you know, some kind of parole after that. Um, and, you know, these cases are what they are. You know, they're very difficult to win. Um, you can't, how are you going to win uh, a case where you, the blood alcohol level is probably a certainty, um, depending upon, you know, I don't know what the evidence is, but typically they know what they're doing. And typically, um, you know, the blood alcohol is not really an issue. And then you've got the conduct. You, you have a dead body. You've got uh, somebody who um, was traveling at a really high rate of speed in a, uh, in a residential neighborhood and caused a, just a horrific crash. I mean, look at this car. I mean, that is just awful. And the problem is, is that you can't send your client to treatment in this case in hopes that um, he's not going to do any prison time because the statute prohibits the prosecutor from actually engaging in any kind of plea negotiations that are less than the mandatory minimum. Which is, you know, unfortunate because I, I've had cases like this before where a client was um, needed a clean up and you can hold a bunch more prison time over their head and keep him sober for much longer than this two years or however much time he's going to do. One of the things that needs to be considered in this is the aggravating factor, that being the speed and the, and the sheer recklessness that happened in this case. You've got double the legal limit, you've got 156 miles per hour, and you've got two victims. That really says that he might even get a much longer than the, than the mandatory minimum. So this was his initial appearance. And like I said, they determined bail and read the charges, right? And then the next step is to go to a pretrial hearing to determine uh, the admissibility of evidence in some cases. So you'll have a contested evidentiary hearing sometimes. Um, and then they determine whether or not they're going to have a trial. They probably won't have a trial. But the lawyer in this case will want to drag this out as much as possible because you want to put your client through treatment. You want uh, to show that remorse. You want, to, you want you know, something to show that he's, he's made some amends. And so then it will either be a plea or a trial. That's on the guilt phase of things. And then if he pleads guilty, then they'll have a sentencing. And that's when we'll know. We, so we won't know for quite a while how much time he's going to get. 
Um, but those are all factors where, uh, you know, or all situation where the aggravating factors come into play. And, uh, and then you're going to have, you know, I was just in a homicide sentencing last week. And, you know, the families get up and they, and they just give these heart-wrenching speeches. You know, uh, you know, Tatiana will never walk down the aisle. She'll never have grandchildren. She'll never do this. She'll never do that. You know, I'll never. And it's just, you know, you can't argue with it. Because you just have to sit there and, and you know, and, and, and sympathize with them, honestly. That's the best way to handle those things. So, so this has been uh, a, uh, an update on Henry Ruggs III on his criminal vicar homicide case out of Las Vegas, Nevada. First round draft pick, uh, former Raiders receiver, um, had the world by the tail, and has lost it, lost everything for what, for booze. I hope this is a lesson to all of you out there. Be careful. If you're going to drink, get in an Uber. It, it costs you nothing compared to what it costs otherwise. So this is Bruce Rivers. Subscribe, like, follow us on Twitter. If you're watching us, follow us on Instagram. Sign up for Patreon. And we'll see you next time on Criminal Lawyer Reacts.